Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners all over the world, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We are back here with another special episode, as if the other episodes are not special. But we are back here with another episode. I am your host, Deshaunt, and I am here with my buddy, my partner in crime, my co-host, my cohort, my confidant, my friend, the guy I can lean on, my support system. Is this the Golden Girls intro? What is this? (laughs) Maybe. It is Dan, the man with the million dollar plan who apparently never gives a damn. No, I don't. Neither you should. This episode, bigger, honestly, than WrestleMania 40, in my opinion. Wow. As we talk about the aftermath. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) Go ahead. You take it away. (laughs) No, it's fine. Yeah, we are here to review, naturally, as it is after we do the previews for all these pay-per-view events, we are here to review WrestleMania 40. It is in the books. The dust has settled. The smoke has cleared. It is the day after. Monday Night Raw is actually going on right now as we speak. But we are here to talk about WrestleMania 40. Now, Dan, before we get started, I will put you on the spot. All right. What did you think, if you could describe this WrestleMania in one word, what would it be? I think I told you before we went on air that I would use the word solid. What's one word you would use to describe WrestleMania 40 and overall, what did you think? Cathartic. Wow. My, my okay. Yeah, very and, interesting. And my my justification for that is because in the preview episode we kind of talked about, we, I mean we talked about the uncertainty surrounding WrestleMania and the fact that that gave an added level of like intrigue to the show. However, we were also going into into it with a, I would say, healthy level of um, skepticism. Yeah. Not to say that we thought it was going to be it would be as bad as it was under the control of VKM. But given the new era, especially like I, I watched clips of the Hall of Fame and I, I caught the intro of uh Raw the with um the reveal of the uh the entrance of the champion. Uh but everybody really touting Triple H. Praising yeah. Triple H, yeah. Paul Heyman, a Paul Levesque guy. Uh, so the confidence everybody seems to have in this new era, this new wave of professional wrestling, is uh, it's a relief. Yeah. And getting to see that we didn't steer away from making this a satisfying show which we'll break down into smaller pieces, is it's a relief. With all that tension, with all that unsettling energy around, are they, are they going to screw this up? You saw my uncertainty during the preview episode where I wanted to believe that Cody was going to win, but I couldn't, I couldn't settle on that prediction, on that prophecy. Exactly. And so to get to the end of it and feel, not feel deflated like last, last year. Last year. It, I, I, would, I would stick with cathartic. Very interesting. That's actually a very good way of putting it. Like I said, my word for it is solid. And I, it's literally for the same exact reasons that you mentioned. But what's WrestleMania without a bunch of wrestling matches? So let's get into it. I will be your match breakdown guy for night one. And then Dan the Man will be your match breakdown guy for night number two. So we kick off WrestleMania. Well, theoretically, we kick off WrestleMania. Triple H comes out very quick. Hey, welcome to WrestleMania. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the show. I will sort of sprinkle this in because I think it's the it's the perfect time to do so. I told you right before we got on air, this seemed to be the first WrestleMania in maybe over 10 years. We didn't have any long, pointless segments where it just drags on or we're advertising a product or, you know, how's everybody feeling tonight and like, you know, and all that. Yeah, we obviously obviously did the attendance records and that sort of thing. We got rid of some of the advertising even though we slapped a... Uh, drink right in the middle of the ring. But. In the middle of the ring, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of my point is that much like with this Triple H segment, it was short. It was to the point. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the show. He's added there. Let's get to the first match. 
So, for the first match here, we have for the singles match for the Women's World Championship, Rhea Ripley going in, walking in as champion, defeats Becky Lynch uh, in 17 minutes and 5 seconds. Now, this is one of the things we talked about in the preview was not only matches in general, but female matches getting a re- reasonable and respectable amount of time. So giving these two 17 minutes to open the show, not a bad sign of things to come. So I do agree, yes. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll kind of share my sentiments and then I'll let you go ahead. Yes, definitely. And I also kind of felt like as far as time goes, this year was a lot more well-balanced. Yeah. I didn't feel like one match was like 25 minutes long and then the other match was like seven minutes long. There seemed to be a sort of a nice little healthy balance. Obviously, your main event is going to hoard up a lot more time because of who's involved and what's at stake. But to get to Rhea and Becky, this match was great. I enjoyed it from start to finish, spot after spot after spot. I, I, what I love about this match is that not only did Rhea Ripley beat Becky Lynch, she conclusively, definitively beat Becky Lynch. Yeah. Um, she does like the electric chair on the outside, which is kind of like your impact move of like, oh, that's okay, that's going to make her a bit groggy. Does a semi-riptide on the turnbuckle, Becky Lynch kind of bounces off of the turnbuckle, then she does the riptide again, definitive victory. Yeah. Um... And, like, I don't look at this as, oh, Becky Lynch is now buried or it it takes her, like, you know, a a notch below. Definitive victory. Great match. These two are very great performers. Uh, We both wanted uh, Rhea Ripley to win. Um, I could even see Becky Lynch taking a small sabbatical after this to kind of promote her book and to kind of be away um, along with her husband, which we'll get to a little bit later on. But I thought this match was great at WrestleMania. You want to have that great opener to kind of get the crowd going, and this got the job yeah, done. Yeah, the, these two are definitely two strong female competitors that you can rely on to bring the quality. Yeah. yeah just looking at the match lengths, like we said, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to credit this one as the second longest match, given weight of number of performers. Yeah. Because you've got 46... 46, 44 minutes for the tag team main event with uh, The Rock and Roman versus Seth and Cody. You got the ladder match for the tag belts at seventeen twenty-five, which was kind of a double match, having to split both split the, the tag belts. titles. Yeah. So the fact that this is technically your third longest match, but it's longer than every other match on the card... Uh, gives these two the weight they need. No weapons, no shenanigans, just straight up two women beating the hell out of each other. Exactly. And furthermore, like you said, the definitive uh, conclusion of the match, the nice thing about the way it ended, and the it's kind of the same thing as when Cody busts out the triple uh, crossroads, yeah. is that it makes your opponent feel stronger or bigger because... You need that extra kick. You, yeah. You don't just beat them, and especially at WrestleMania, you don't just beat them with one of your finisher. Unless it's a match that doesn't mean much, uh, or you've built to it. But the, I, admittedly, I think finishers, for the most part, have on their own lost some of their luster from yesteryear. But I would almost say that that cr- gives a little bit more credibility to the performers because it leaves that ability on a uh, uh, PLE to do something like that where you have Roman hit three spears and Cody still kicks out or you have Roman with two spears and a Samoan spike from the apron and a super kick from Jey Uso and then it still takes another one just yeah. to, ju- or another two the the one where he springs off 16 times and then hits him yeah just to put him down things like that so no the solid solid way to kick off the show made becky still feel like the man like becky lynch and so when she comes back she can slide into that's assuming she steps away but it would make sense yeah to take a little bit of a hiatus um it leaves room for somebody else to step into the shoes against Rhea, and when she comes back, for her to pick up with a feud that's not cycling around the belt. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will circle back to what you were just talking about, finishers kind of losing that mystique, because there was actually one match here that ended 
with just one finisher, which kind of caught me off guard, but was kind of a breath of fresh air. But now that we have our sentiments about that, let's move on to the second match here. We have the six-pack tag team ladder match for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. Um, we have A-Town Down Under, Austin Theory and Grayson Waller uh, versus Awesome Truth, The Miz and R-Truth. Uh, versus the Judgment Day, Finn Balor and Damian Priest, versus DIY Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, versus the New Day, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods. Uh, and we have the New Catch Republic, Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate. Um, so. Yeah, they, it, it, it's not fun to read this match, is it? <laughs> it's not, especially when you don't know the format that they're trying to uh, give you the result in. But essentially, what happened here is that A Town Down retrieved the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. And then Awesome Truth got the Raw Tag Team Championships. Which, so. which is not something that we uh, actively anticipated when we made our uh, predictions in the preview episode. Yeah. I thought this match was fine. I didn't see anything that really necessarily was kind of like a, the, you know, the, the new OMG moment. I thought it was fine for what it was. Uh, they kept on teasing like one tag team is going to you know grab you know grab the belt and then somebody would tug that person down. Um, but I think inevitably there was one team that rightfully you know was supposed to win this match, and that was awesome truth. Yeah, the crowd was behind it. I think they knew that you know it's it's time that we you know that we kind of do something with our truth, especially with all the reactions he's been getting. I thought it was a fine match. Um, I think we've seen better ladder matches at, at a WrestleMania, obviously. But I thought this was fine. I thought that the decision for A-Town Down was a little bit interesting and not for the better. Um, I thought that maybe like a DIY could have gotten that belt and then Awesome Truth could have gotten the Raw Championships. But that's just me. Go ahead. What do you think? Well, no, I was just gonna, I was going to chime in. I was going to say that the this is obviously your gimmick match of the, of the night. Yeah. Because you have the street fight the following night, but otherwise everything else is relatively straightforward. Straight yeah. With this one, you have eight town down. The 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 thing that I I can see being the justification here is that it's generally a not a rule, but it it it's a trend to have faces go after heel champions and that that's that tend tends to be the the thing that creates more of an interesting story i guess now you obviously have to have faces win every once in a while which is yeah. where we get the awesome truth side of it who knows how long either team's going to hold it but to your point or off your point a town down being the heel tag champs now gives them something to do that we didn't we we talked about them not really having anything to do right now yeah and austin theory was vkm's chosen one there for a bit but he's gone and i'm sure that they don't want to punish austin theory for that yeah so this is probably a way to reintegrate him into things you could have those two feud with somebody like DIY, and then you've got DIY as your faces pursuing the, the titles. Yeah. Uh, as for Awesome Truth, uh, Judgment Day obviously may come back after that uh, in the interim, and that, with what we'll talk about regarding Damian Priest, that kind of leaves the door open for a different combination of Judgment Day members to be the ones pursuing the belt. So yeah. there's a lot that walks out of this match that we didn't necessarily have walking in. Right, exactly. But yeah, I thought it was fine for what it was. I didn't. It was really, a passable match. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it was anything too special. Uh, like you said, this was your gimmick match of the night, so it kind of is what it is. And I think we t- one thing we did mention during the preview was that you have a lot of talented dudes in here, which makes them able to carry the match. Was it necessarily going to be the most looked forward match of the night? No, but it's here to accomplish something which yeah. it did. And I think like I think that Triple H's fingerprints are kind of all over the match because I could see him being like, okay, let's split up these titles so that we have something for Raw and we got something for SmackDown. Yeah, it, g- so. it gives both shows a way to feel unique still. Yeah, exactly. 
Moving on to the third match of the night, and by the way, the latter match was 17 minutes and 25 seconds, which I know you kind of alluded to, uh, second longest match uh, of the night. But our third match here, uh, which actually, and again, um, this was kind of circumstantial because had we known about this change, I think our predictions would have been very different. But we have Rey Mysterio and now Andrade uh, versus... Instead, instead of Dragon Lee. Yeah. Um, versus Santos Escobar and Dirty Dom Dom Dominic Mysterio. Uh, Rey Mysterio and Andrade uh, win this match conclusively uh, in 11 minutes and 5 seconds. Uh, I know that they filmed like a thing where Dragon Lee was uh, attacked or injured or something, and so they slid in Andrade, which I thought if you just did that initially would have been a little bit more impactful. Like, newest day of LWO, here's Andrade. But yeah, I know... Especially f- given the fact that now we've sort of just added two LWO members in the last couple of weeks, which is weird. Yeah. But I know for a fact that Andrade has kind of been talking with the Judgment Day, and there's talks of, or oh, we're interested, where we want to see, you know, where this ends up. So that's kind of weird. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Rey Mysterio and Andrade win the match against Santos Escobar and Dirty Dominic Mysterio. I thought it was a fine match. I think there was maybe like one or two memorable spots, but then at the very end, I kind of like, I knew as I was watching when I saw those two masked men like come out and attack Dominic, I'm like, these guys are football players. Like I, (laughs) you know, just by looking at their body, I'm like, they're, they're football players. Like I know there's that cross promotion that wwe always likes to integrate with like sports and especially football so and and the local city yeah (laughs) so um i thought this was fine i didn't really see it as anything special uh there was a nice uh there was actually a nice move where uh andrade had ray on his shoulders and he jumped off and they both did a double cross body from like the apron to the um to Mm. the outside so i thought that was pretty cool um other than that it was what it was. Yeah, this this is one of your matches where you have some of your high flyers or your more athletic dudes highlighting what they what they can do, uh, but it it wasn't re- it, Again, we talked about Dominic being in this as sort of a weird why type of thing. Dan, why why is Dominic even in this match? But yeah, you got your high flyers doing high flyery things. Um, that aspect was was fine. I, I, I agree. I feel like from a conciseness standpoint, you could have kind of approached it either way, the switch, where either Ray is like mulling over who, like you could have done, he, he isn't sure who to pick. Oh, there's so many strong candidates in the LWO. Oh, but surprise, surprise, day of, uh, it's him. Kind of Kind of like Seth with, who, I'll fight anybody a couple years ago yeah, when Cody yeah. came back. Yeah. But the alternative I could I, I think could have concisely handled it is Dragon Lee gets beat up and then uh, you have some, so a, a very short segment where Andrade basically comes up on Dom and he says, you know what? I don't like how you handle business. And he offer, like he offers to take Dragon Lee's place instead of siding with Judgment Day yeah. after all. And that could have told a, a little bit more of a story than just this. Insert, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's I mean that's pretty much all that there is to it. Um, moving on to the next match here. Consequently, the same length as uh, the, yeah. the previous match. Yeah, you're right. Um, we have Jey Uso defeating his twin brother, Jimmy Uso, in 11 minutes and 5 seconds. I know that this is a match that second to Rock and Roman it, like has always been talked about. Yeah. Brother versus brother at WrestleMania. Like, let's see who the dominant twin is. This match honestly was uh, very lackluster. Yeah. Um, I like the whole super kick spot where give me your best shot. You know, the guy holds his chin out, and then you know Jay does the super kick, and then you know then he holds his chin out. Okay, now you give me a super kick. Um, too much of that. And I, I don't I don't like it. Um, you know, you have the whole thing where, like, you know, Jimmy is like, wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. And then, you know, Jay starts stops his super kick and, like, they shake hands for a second. And I thought Jay was going to, like, be the one to be like, psych, 
you know, kick him, do the Uso splash. But then Jimmy ultimately was the one who, um, you know, did all that. Again, nothing too special. Um, it just, it was what it was. We both predicted of Jay winning, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy is, I hate to put it this way, he's a non-factor. Yeah. And the fact that Jimmy has been uh, Roman's chihuahua for such a long time now, the the viability of him beating Jay, who's only been booked, mar- like, slightly better, there was little chance that Jimmy was going to beat Jay yeah. in this match. There wasn't a reason to. Uh, again, with the season finale vibe of WrestleMania, it made more sense for Jay to win. And now this starts the story of Jimmy's redemption, where we will presumably, probably, honestly, if we're being completely honest, see the Usos come back together and jump <laughs> back into the tag titles. Um, or at least the tag division. But... Uh, I don't know. I unless they really want to switch or switch it up and start booking Jimmy better. Yeah. But yeah, it served its purpose. I again, it it didn't live up to the hype we would have hoped for. Yeah. But now it's on the books, and the unfortunate side is that it probably showed that we don't need to really do it again. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. You know, I don't necessarily think this is a... And again, I might be wrong. You know, we might see a rematch at a backlash or whatever. Oh, yeah. And then we can can do it as a throwaway pay-per-view. Yeah. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But nonetheless, moving down the card, we have the six-woman tag team match. The team of Jade Cargill, Bianca Belair, and Naomi defeated Damage Control, consisting of Dakota Kai, Asuka, and Kairi Sane. This was a match that was eight minutes and five seconds. Shortest match of the evening. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fine. I know you and I very much were flirting with the idea of planting a seed in this match about Bianca and Jade and Naomi and one sort of like, hey, what are you doing? This is my moment. Back off. You're new here. I'm, a, I'm the veteran. Um, we didn't really get any of that. It was just like... Yeah, we're felt all more on the like same a straight, straightforward match. Yeah, they were no, all... No real ego moments. <laughs> exactly. Um, I thought it was fine. Um, kind of a statistic that I kind of feel a little bit bad about. So Bianca extends her WrestleMania record to 4-0. and And poor Asuka is like 0-7 at this point. Has she been around that long? Damn. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm very big with that. I'm very big with, like, you know, giving everybody a moment. Sasha Banks kind of was getting the same treatment up until she had, like, the one win with Naomi. But, again, nothing too special about this match. This is where I kind of feel like WrestleMania sort of dwindled a little bit because you have the solid opener, and the next couple matches are just kind of there, you know. Um I think it, you know, it was inevitable with these three winning. You're not going to have a team consisting especially of Bianca Belair and Jade losing to damage control. So I thought it was what it was, but I do see that this match kind of like becomes an ex- becomes the seed where we eventually see like maybe you could even do these three teaming up again at a backlash or whatever. And then slowly that's when you start seeing hey, okay, you're stepping on my toes now. You need to back off, and then you you start building whatever you need to build there. Yeah. Obviously not seeing uh, Raw as it's going. We don't know any aftermath. Maybe we start to actually build toward a program with some of the members of this match, but who's to say? Uh, But off of your point about the structure of the card, uh, or how it delivered at least, yeah, you have a strong start, then you have it sort of peter off for a a chunk in yeah, the middle. a big chunk. And then you come back and you have a couple of big things happen at the end. So it's a very it's a very front front and back heavy loaded show. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because then the middle just kind of feels a little soggy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about this match, unless if you have something I, else you want to add. I'll just, I'll summarize my thoughts. I think this is the, that that, that was realistically probably the way it, it needed, needed to be booked, so that you don't 
have your new superstar in the form of Jade take a loss at the first WrestleMania. Uh, While even, protecting Bianca. Yeah. Uh, but, I I mean, I also feel like it could have gone the other way and planted some more interesting seeds to grow. Yeah. Agreed. So now we move down the line, and this is where things really start picking up again. And I love this because, I mean, such a great match. We have a singles match for the WWE Intercontinental Championship. Sami Zayn defeats Gunther to become the Intercontinental Champion uh, in 15 minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, very quickly, if we can rewind for a second, Sami is getting ready to come out, unless if this was like um, taped ahead of time. Uh, he's kind of talking with his wife, his little kid, and it's kind of this cute moment where the kid goes, you can do it, dad, you can do it, dad. And I'm paraphrasing. I forget what the actual verbiage was. And he gives his family a hug, gives them a kiss, and then runs into Kevin Owens. And Kevin Owens, and this was, I thought we were onto something here because I mentioned about the WrestleMania 20-esque moment that we could potentially get. Um, Kevin Owens goes, go out there and, and do it. You know, go out there and win. The match, the match itself, I thought was great. And what I love is that you saw someone sort of bust out. And the first match sort of did this. Um, the, ma- the main event of night two essentially kind of did this as well. Where it's like you were saying earlier, you have to bust out like that one move that you maybe haven't used in a long time. Yeah, everything. You got to get everything on the on the table. So, Sami Zayn towards the end of the match, you know, Gunther is just beating him down and just mauling him down. Sami like is doing the Daniel Bryan-esque, you know, thing where his body is jittering and he's slowly building himself back up. And then you see him do the the video game move essentially where he lifts Gunther up. Brain busters him on the turnbuckle, gives him about two hell of a kicks. One, two, three, Sami Zayn is your new champion. Yeah. I know you essentially said that you were in the camp to see Chad Gable in this position and potentially dethrone Gunther. I made the idea of Damian Priest cashing in and, you know, grabbing the Intercontinental Championship, which he did, but he did on a much bigger uh, championship. So now I'm curious from you. I want to know from you. I personally thought this match, the match itself was very solid. It was fun. Anything with Gunther is great. Anything with Sammy is great. I thought these two had a wonderful performance. Where are you? What do you think about this? Do you still think that Chad Gable should have been in this position? Uh, Sammy Zayn is anything but El Generico. And there's a reason that Gunther is the ring general. Uh, no, it was a very strong match. Uh, I can't imagine we expected anything less than for, for these two, uh, who are very, very competent wrestlers and performers to go out there and put on a show. I recently saw a clip of an old Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens match and oh, like real old before WWE and oh boy, did it feel like they should have hurt each other multiple times during that match. But seeing where Sammy has come from and where he is, you 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 can safely bet that he's going to put on a strong showing. And especially with him sort of adopting, uh, not necessarily at the same level on the card, but kind of adopting the Daniel Bryan position of your ultimate your scruffy ultimate underdog who doesn't look like he should be at the top of the card. He, he, he is as far as the Chad Gable goes. I think that you could have put Chad Gable in this instead of Sammy. Okay. And I think that it would have had the same ultimate impact, but I think it's fine that they didn't. Now they can take Chad and he, he should still win this title at some point. I would love nothing more, and not not that I know how to put this together, but I would love nothing more than to rehash. I forget when when it happened exactly, but you remember remember the tri- triple threat match: Jericho, uh, Stevie Richards, and Kurt, where it was two falls, yeah, yeah. two falls for each belt. WrestleMania two thousand. Yeah. I would love to see a match do that same 
rule at some point. If you put the, and you could even do it where you throw the IC and uni, uh, I almost said universal, the US? IC and US champions in the match separately, still have it be a two out of three falls, and you could shuffle the belts that way. Yeah. And I think that would be just as interesting. It would be kind of like a mini scramble match. Yeah. But as for now, I'm content with how this played out, and I know Chad will, and I know Chad will get his flowers at some point. But no, great way to to get the show back on track before we head into the marquee matchup. Definitely, yeah. I thought that this match was great. Uh, I. Seeing how Triple H is keeping his eye on everybody and making sure that everybody is included and it's an all-inclusive product, I think it's only a matter of time of Chad Gable. I would even suggest maybe I could see it happening at a SummerSlam. We'll just have to see. But I do see somewhere down the line Chad Gable becoming your Intercontinental Champion. Um, Now we come down to the main event for night one. We have, so it's a tag team match. Uh, with the stipulation being that if The Rock and Roman won, that it would be bloodline rules in the main event of Night 2. If Seth and Cody win, then it would just be a straight-up match for Night 2. So we have the bloodline consisting of The Rock and Roman Reigns defeating the team of Cody Rhodes and Seth freaking Rollins in your longest match of the night. uh, By far. 44 minutes and 35 seconds. When I when I looked at the the ticker for duration um, on the replay when I went back and was going through stuff, I saw where the commercial commercial break was on Peacock right before the main event. I went, "How long was this match?" <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Forty five minutes of mass chaos, few very quick points. The Rock hasn't missed a beat. I know for a fact that when he came back literally the first day of the year, he had this segment with Jinder Mahal. He hit like a rock bottom at people's elbow. Many people were very quick to point out that after that people's elbow, he was breathing heavy. He looked bloated. He looked like he was trying to catch his breath. But in this match, The Rock looked immaculate. Yeah. He was ready to go. He, you know, took all the spots on the chin um, he was everything timing, everything was there, the conditioning was there, um, loved his gear. Um, I Pat, think Pat Mack, if he was talking on, uh, when he was, he was talking to, uh, Cody, uh, today, he was talking about how, or one of them, it was either Cody or Pat mentioned it, that Roman showed up in the best shape of his career for this, for, for the, for Sunday night and technically Saturday, not much would have changed in 24 yeah. hours. But that he showed up looking great. Well, The Rock, who hasn't done this in a thousand years and has been notorious for being on social media, just jacked to the gills, showed up lean. Yeah. He looked lean. He looked fit. Um, He looked like a man who maybe hadn't ripped his abdominal muscles off the bone at WrestleMania 29. So, yeah, to have him show up looking the way he, he did and to perform the way he did uh, during this entire uh, feud, uh, very impressive for a Absolutely. man his age. Absolutely. Um, I got, I don't know about you, I got a very much Attitude Era-esque vibes when they started going around into the crowd and around the ring and Roman and Seth are on the ramp, Cody and The Rock are like out out in the crowd the, the rock straight up telling the referee i'm i'm the boss if you count you're fired uh and then it suddenly becoming a not not falls count anywhere match but yeah a anything goes type of type of match um brilliant this was absolutely great um they did everything that they needed to do uh and i thought very conscious decision making having the rock pin cody um, because essentially it's like, okay, you could have Roman pitting, like pinning Cody on night one, but what are we trying to prove? Yeah. It and, it keeps your, your two guys from night two still separated, uh, in the result so that you don't necessarily go, well, what's the point? Roman beat him last night. Why are we bothering or anything like that? And also I think it's to further plant a seed in the Cody and rock 
storyline that we're going to get eventually. But all that out of the way, this was great. These guys did what they needed to do. Um, the Rock, I mean, he looks like he's doing it like, you know, weekly on the road. Like you yeah. would think that he's like wrestling weekly on the road. He great shape. Um, they did everything they needed to do. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier that, you know, there were so, some um, things trending online about some botches that happened in the match. I didn't see anything that took me out of it. Yeah, I there, there was nothing jarring enough to where, unless you're looking for it, things to post online on your little news site for clicks, there's no reason that you needed to bring it up. Like... I will also say one thing that was executed perfectly because every we, we like I see this coming every single time it happens. Um, something happens, I think, on the announce table. And then Seth Spears Roman through the barricade? No. No, Ro- Roman speared Seth. I don't remember what happened on the table. Um... <laughs> Okay, so we have to, like, verify that now. But <laughs> um, what I loved is that you didn't see it coming. Yeah. Before, you have the one guy kind of lingering by that breakable barricade, and it's, like, a wide shot, and you clearly see the other guy, like, running halfway around to, like, come and spear this guy. This time, you didn't see it coming. And I thought, like, that's that's what we need. We don't need the predictable you know, 15 seconds before it happens, have the long shot so we see everything. So the camera work and everything was very, very good. Um, <laughs> what it, it was that Cody, it was The Rock was going to rock bottom Cody through the table. And then did and Cody Co- do a Cody, back body drop? No, Cody, I think, rock bottomed him through the table. Okay. But Seth, Seth came over and like grabbed The Rock's leg to stop uh, him from doing it. And then as he was, like, stumbling away, I think that's when he got speared, which is what took him out of the rest of the match. Okay. Yeah. So... If what, I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure that's how it played out. <laughs> well, however it played out, I just love the fact that it was unpredictable and you didn't see it coming. Yeah. So, much like the, the entirety of this match. It was a little like a jump... And it wasn't scary, but it was a little like a jump scare in a horror movie because, yeah, like you said, a lot of times you got that lead up where you're like, oh, there's... Roman, there's Braun Strowman, there's Bobby Lashley over there. They're going to come running around. And this time it was framed in a way where Seth is Seth kind of like stumbles close to camera and then all of a sudden there yeah. it is. Yeah. And you're like, oh, oh man. And it, I think that that helps with some of the like momentary excitement yeah. because you don't, um, it, it's, you don't always have to do the like Hitchcock approach to the, the ticking time bomb. Sometimes you can you can just have the explosion happen and it happen it works just as well. Yeah. It's but all, it's all circumstantial. I, absolutely. Yeah. But I will wrap up my thoughts and I will throw it over to you. Wonderful match, excellent match. The Rock has not missed a beat when it comes to character work, heel work, persona, delivering in the ring, uh bringing eyes on the product. Um Roman as you said was in the best shape of his life. Seth and Cody fought their butts off, considering the fact that they both respectively had a match on night two waiting for them. So I thought this match was great. Was it a little bit on the long side? Yes, it was. We're talking about a 45-minute match. But all that considered, I personally enjoyed it. It was a bit nostalgic. The Rock being my second favorite wrestler of all time, I enjoyed the hell out of this. I'm throwing it over to you. Your thoughts, your sentiments. What did you think? I believe that the match ended the way it needed to. We talked about it on the preview that in order to really stick the landing for night two, you needed to have the bloodline rules on that match. In full effect. Yeah, to really stack the deck against Cody in the first place so that then you were like, ooh, man, how's he going to do it? And then we'll delve into how that all plays out uh, here in the second half. But the fact of the matter is that yeah, The Rock did a magnificent job for somebody who hasn't really done this in a very long time. Roman, I, I, I think I commented to you, looks like he was having a great time recently with these this story. And I think that he is probably hyped for next year when I think 
is now the going to be the inevitable plan yeah. for the match they were teasing. Now, as far as how it ended, ended, we did see this match end kind of like a typical Roman Reigns match in that you have the face in Cody look like, oh, well, maybe maybe he's going to pull it off. And then you have the one the one surprise hit in the form of the belt whip, which sounded, again, horrendous. Uh, throws him off his game. Roman hits the spear. And then, yeah, Rock gets the... Uh, that, again, I'll, I'll let you continue. Uh, but just one thing I know you were talking about, like, sometimes it's just better to just not see it coming yeah. and to just do it. Um, cause like I knew for a fact that that's, that's another giveaway is that when Cody does the crossroads Trinity after the second one, you see him walking backwards and usually when he's getting near the ropes, much like we found out last year, it's solo waiting to spike him this year. And I thought it was solo again, coming to interfere. It's the rock just reeling back and just whipping him across the back. Which looks like it sucks and it hurts, but I do love the surprise element of it. Have you ever held a weight belt? I can't say that I have. They are not light. So the, the force of that swinging and hitting somebody across the back is probably a nightmare. Get probably it? Probably an American nightmare. Do you get it? <laughs> but continue. Um, no, yeah. Having that kind of come out of... Like, you have the, the, the wobble... But having the strike actually come out of out of nowhere was like oh yeah, and you could feel not the it wasn't it wasn't the same def, like deflation as uh, WrestleMania thirty nine when Cody lost, but it was like a moment of like oh that's yeah. how this is gonna go, <laughs> yeah. but in like a in 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 a still fulfilling way. Because you you anticipated it was going to happen. You had the crowd cheering for The Rock at the top of the show. Uh, I'm really sorry, but since you said that, it reminded me of something. There was literally an, it, there was a moment where I think like when Cody was in the ring with The Rock, Cody was getting booed. Yeah. But then when it was Cody and Roman in the ring, Cody was getting cheered. Yeah. And it's amazing to see, and like I think that's why when people talk about Attitude Era, it's it's that dominance that it that it, it kind of still holds with it. That an Attitude Era star, when he's in the ring with the with against the one guy that everybody on social media like had a movement for, yeah. But all of a sudden, when they're in the ring and you got that Attitude Era guy staring across from you, every, like not everybody, but like you could hear the boos. The cheers were right there, but the boos weren't too far behind. You can draw the comparison between, uh, what was it, 19? No. Uh, when he, 18. When him and, when The Rock and Hogan were facing off. And Hogan was the heel. Yeah. And The Rock was the face. And you had the, the switch you had to kind of do. And I, I think, I don't think Cody ever abandoned being the face. Mm-hmm. But they adapted. He knows how to wrestle. He knows how to tell a story. And th- everybody in this match did a great job yeah. doing doing just that. And to see the dejected reactions by both Cody and Seth after they'd lost and almost the mirroring of the shot from last year with Cody oh, sitting yeah, they in the did ring. That, didn't they? Yeah. What, it was beautiful. It was a great way to end it and set up the anticipation for night two where you're like, oh, snap, now it's bloodline rules. Let's see what happens. Uh, and so I, th- I think that they ended night one exactly as it should have. Uh, I think that Michael Cole was also spot on where, like, the second they won, he's like, Co-, like, as the three count is going, he goes, Cody is screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He he and McAfee were not mincing words about code the the state of the roads for the following night. Um, very quick before we get into night two, I didn't think about this until maybe halfway through the day today. If we can um, assign an MVP to this WrestleMania, I think we need to give it to Seth Rollins. Yes. Um, Seth lost the match, and he had a wonderful outing. Uh. We're going to talk about what comes literally next. Um, Twice. It's not even like he only showed up on the card for night two once. And then in the main event, yeah. uh, essentially took a beating. Yeah. Um, he, he he was a difference maker 
in the story and also in WrestleMania. Definitely. I don't I don't think anything would have uh not that's over overstating it, but I don't think that everything would have had the same impact had he not played the part he played. Exactly. So very quickly, I just wanted to say I think Seth is your MVP when it comes to this WrestleMania. Um you know, he is as good as he says he is and if the guy needs time off, you better give it to him. Because after what he did for for Cody and everybody at Mania, this man deserves it. Yeah, he, he, he left WrestleMania with WWE in a very good place to go yes. into Raw tonight. Yes, absolutely. So, so that carries us into night two. Go ahead, which Dan. starts off with a, another... How long is this one? 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah, with a with a ten minute thirty second world heavyweight championship match in the form of Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre. Now we talk we were we were talking back and forth about this one of sh- is Drew gonna win? Is some like it, are they gonna swerve in this one in some way? And they did. I think they did right by everybody in this match. They made Seth still look strong. They made Drew look. So, look, look like a, a very competent opponent. I think we had like seven Claymore kicks happen in this match. Uh, and Drew walks out of the initial match as world heavyweight champion. And you have this very, you have this nice moment where there is sort of a character drop where Drew is holding the title. And the crowd, this is another match where even though Drew was the heel... He's done enough in the last four years for this company that the fans appreciate him. Yes. And he wins. We uh, say anticipated that is subjective, but we, we were sort of anticipating that this was a very real possibility to finally give him his coronation from 2020. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's this nice moment. It feels deserved. He, he's on his knees. He's looking at Seth, who's emotional, Looks like he has a shiner from probably taking an actual claymore to the face, and I don't. I I was reading their lips. I don't know exactly what Drew said, because it, it was somebody online. You know, I was looking at comments on the video, and it looked like somebody suggested he said, "Thank you, man." I don't think he did. He said something, and then Seth goes, "You f- deserve it." Yeah, yeah. That I saw that. Yeah. And so it was this nice drop of character moment where Seth sort of like passes passes the torch passes the torch over to Drew and says take care of it yeah and there's no there's no character of Seth being disappointed in the overall outcome he i'm sure he played a part in even making this decision and building up to this in the way that they did but they played their parts just wonderfully meanwhile you also have CM Punk over on commentary and you keep teasing those you keep toying with the fact that drew can't take his focus off of cm punk he can't leave cm punk uh at the wayside and when he finally gets done in the ring receiving the the praise of the fans he gets down he climbs up on the table and he's talking shit to cm punk my favorite part of this exchange it like god cm punk is an infuriating guy sometimes not like like just like he has an ego to him, and sometimes you're like, God, this fucking guy. But Drew goes over and he's on the table and he looks at CM Punk and he he says something to him about I want you to listen to me, and CM Punk says I want you to know that's what it was. He says I want you to know that da 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 da, and he elaborates and CM Punk goes I want you to know I can't hear a word you're saying because I got cans on, <laughs> and. He, I think he then shifts gears and he starts to lock in on what Drew's actually saying so that he can respond. But what ultimately happens is Drew, digging so deeply into this, CM Punk cracks and attacks him. Yeah. And as Drew is now laying on the floor, you hear I, Damien's theme? Or Judgment Day theme. I think... No, I think it's Judgment Day. It's a theme. It's a, a theme. theme song plays. Which I didn't know what it was initially. <laughs> which is 
which is a is a different topic for a different day, which I know we talked about a long time ago with theme songs and being impactful and being able to identify the person immediately, uh, which is where somebody like Cody Rhodes' theme uh, excels. Excels. But, yeah, Damien comes running down and the crowd pops because anytime somebody cashes in, it's exciting, even more so when they cash in at WrestleMania. And he comes down and he comes around the ring and he clobbers Drew with the, the briefcase, chucks him in, hits him with South of Heaven, and I think that was immediately it. I that don't think was there it. was anything else. That was it. Which is why that match lasted nine seconds <laughs> in the record books. <laughs> and Damien walks out with the World Heavyweight Championship, which we didn't necessarily uh, bank on when we were making our Get predictions. <laughs> uh, but, anyway, Damien walks out with the belt. Drew leaves dejected. This leaves Drew with a new... Either Drew gets a little break, too, or this leaves him with a new um, avenue to start to follow. I don't know if I would put Damien versus Drew because Drew is still sort of a still sort of a heel right now. So I would probably give Damien some room to breathe as the World Heavyweight yeah. Champion before trying to pair those two up for something. Especially because I feel like... I don't know. The, we'll have to see how it plays out. I don't know the longevity of this reign for Damian Priest at this moment. But I feel like if you want it to get him anywhere worthwhile, you don't put him against Drew and have Drew lose. Mm-hmm. You put him against somebody else who's maybe a lesser tier, and you could, you essentially final boss it. You have him start with somebody smaller, somebody who is... Still uh, a viable candidate, but not an imposing figure on if the card. If I can interject with yeah. something, I wouldn't mind, especially with him teaming up with Ray on night one, I think Andrade would be a wonderful opponent for Damian Priest. Yeah, because he can beat him, and Andrade hasn't reestablished himself yet in full force to where it's really going to um, hurt him, but, it'll, it, he, but he has enough competence and credibility to... Yeah. Uh, be a stepping stone. I don't know if they have anything else coming up where they're going to be in a more uh, Hispanic Latino region. I because... thought they were going to do backlash at Puerto Rico, especially with last year's reception, but they're doing it in France. So, well, that may not be the place to have that match then. But <laughs> maybe Rene Dupree comes back. La Resistance. Is, he, is Rene Dupree alive? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I might just be thinking of Lance Cade, rest in peace. But, uh, yes, anyway, he is still alive. going off the rails. Um, interesting way to end all of that. Damian Priest walks out, your new world heavyweight champion. It's an exciting way to conclude the story or take these guys to the next chapter of their individual stories and propel Damian Priest up the card. Yeah. So, I guess I'll jump in. A few key things that I kind of wanted to bring up. I thought this... Well, the match between Drew and Seth, I mean. Um, This match started off perfectly. I loved it. Very much Sheamus versus Daniel Bryan-esque. You know, the whole 18-second deal. I thought it started off great, but then it went off the handle. Yeah. I thought we had too many Claymore kicks. Yeah, we had too many that would, stomps. That would probably be my biggest complaint. Is it, it there, was, there's a, there's a uh, threshold where doing a bunch of finishers works, and then where it crosses into being a little lunacy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very, uh, I'm just going to say it, very Brock Lesnar-esque. Yeah. Um, I thought it would have been a little bit more impactful if bell rings, Drew hits a Claymore, one, two, Seth kicks out. Okay, I got one more for you. One more Claymore, and I would have been okay with that being over. Yeah. Because the story here is that Seth just wrestled in a 45-minute match the night before. Yeah. And he's not in the best condition with his back problems and, you know, kind of carrying the weight of the of, of the belt, you know, on his back. You're not burying Seth at that point. I, I don't think, I, I don't want to speak too soon, you can't bury Seth at this point yeah. with everything that he's done. My only, my only st- thing on that is I feel like if they had done that, it could have cheapened Drew's win a little bit. That, that's, that, that's a fair argument, but and maybe you could have had... Okay, because I know they did the Claymore and then they kind of went into the outside. Drew does the release jerk, like um, 
Ger- not German, um, be- like belly to belly suplex. You could have maybe done a little bit more of that, but I just thought that finisher kick out, finisher kick out, finisher kick out. The number of finishers that happened in a ten and a half minute match was way too much. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, they could they could have done the initial claymore and then wrestled for six minutes in like a non repetitive way. And then come back and maybe done the the double claymore and that's it. I would have even taken, for example, Seth like oh they claymore Seth kicks out wrestle for about five minutes. Uh, Seth hits a stomp and then like goes up top to do like a frog splash, catches him with the claymore one two three definitive win. That last claymore looked rough too, so it makes sense. I have to go back and one. see it. So I, yep. I again there was too much to to kind of keep track of. I don't think that's the one that gave Seth the 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 shiner. Yeah. But uh, it 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 looked hard. It did. <laughs> it did. Um, another thing is that it's very interesting because the WrestleMania being themed around finishing the story. I also think in a very um, cathartic way. There's that word that you were using earlier. Um, in a very cathartic way, Drew kind of finished. A story, I don't want to say the story, but he finished a story in the sense of how you mentioned earlier. It was a pandemic for just started. It was locked down. Drew got his moment, but in front of zero people. Yeah. And I think that from that point to now, and this kind of got a little bit repetitious, admittedly, it was always about, I got my moment, but there was nobody there to see it. I have to write that wrong. Yeah. And I think that now this match sort of did that. Uh, granted with the cash in minutes later, but it's like the important part is to lock in the moment. He got it. He got the praise from the crowd to hold up the championship. Cool. You can include it on your highlight packages. It's there. I thought CM Punk on commentary was, was, was funny. Um, Seth walked away, you know, a hero saying that, Hey man, you deserve it, you know, and whatnot. Um, and then the whole Drew gets attacked by CM Punk the theme hits. Um, I here's the thing. I kind of sort of thought of this today. So you recall right before when Batista broke away from Evolution and headlined WrestleMania and became champ against Triple H, right? You recall that Batista was getting little by little, week by week, built as a main event player. Yeah, he was getting built as a threat. To Triple H. He was gaining recognition from the crowd. Bless Damian Priest. I don't really have a problem with him. But I just felt like for a long time he was in the shadow of tag team champion. A guy in the judgment day. Sort of an extra, dare I say. I always felt like judgment day was always met. Like it was microscoped on Rhea Ripley. On our truth, Dominic is getting booed out of the building. Yeah, Damien was a bit player. Yeah, and I think that if you reversed it with Finn Balor cashing in, Finn Balor admittedly, yes, he is in the tag team picture. He's kind of the background player, but it's Finn Balor. He's been universal champion. He The crowd knows who he is. Yeah. Um, so that's where I was kind of like, okay... Fine, let's let's run with it. Let's see what happens. And I kind of thought about it. I'm like, it wouldn't shock me if the World Heavyweight Championship kind of becomes like your new blood experimental title. And then like the WWE is like... Is your established Is guy. your established guy. Exactly. It's, it's now like, if you break all the titles down a little bit into like the WWE title and then the half WWE title or like percentages... The World Heavyweight Championship is basically your 75% ready belt. Mm-hmm. IC is your 65% ready belt. US is like your 50% ready belt. And so now he's getting his chance to try and ride. Yeah. But he doesn't have the same pressures as... Co- uh, he doesn't have the same pressures as uh, the Roman Reigns yeah. would. So... I mean, it makes it makes sense. This is the belt he should have cashed in on. Yeah. And one last thing I'm going to pinpoint is I sent this in our Instagram chat where the idea of storytelling. For weeks, Drew was warning Seth that you're taking your eye off the ball. 
and you're focusing too much on the bloodline, you're focusing on the wrong thing, and that's what's going to lead to me taking your belt. Very interesting turn of events, because then that same fate was what was waiting for Drew McIntyre, where he was hell-bent on focusing on CM Punk, and I'm talking even before the match at Mania, with the promo packages and the t-shirts and the, the trolling, as he says, and the DM hunk and the whole nine yards, eventually became his downfall. Yeah. And I thought, like, that's that almost seems that, I mean, that is very deliberate. That's very much storytelling. You know, you're a hypocrite. You told this guy to not do something. You did the same thing, and it cost you literally everything you've been working yeah, towards it, for the last four Icarus. years. He flew yeah. too close to the sun, and his wings melted. Exactly. But, yeah, what, what I will say about Drew is that I, I would argue Drew is in a similar position professionally as Becky Lynch is. I don't think he has to, like, he can he can take a, a little break, let Damien do something else, come back, and we can get ready for him versus CM Punk. He doesn't have to pursue the title anymore. I think this was the, 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 the not nail in the coffin, because that's the the negative. Uh, the cherry allegory. on top. Yeah, th- this was the cherry on the, the World Heavyweight Championship World title uh, Sunday. Story, yeah. Uh, and I think that he can now move on, and he can be a more valuable performer by having stories and feuds with other people, and I think that it's going to be a more, vi- uh, not vi- viable, but more um, sustainable career trajectory for him. Yeah. And he, there's plenty of marquee moments and feuds and things that he can still do without having to be the guy. Yeah. So I think this is a good, this was a good way to sort of bring, like, put a little bow on this one. I Absolutely. A lot of stories being told here. And uh, you mentioned it for the six women's tag team match. A lot of stories yet to be told from this one match. Yeah. It almost conclusively concluded a few stories, but it's also the beginning of like new chapters for other stories. Yeah. So there you go. And so after all of that and that little cluttery or clunky but satisfying match or turn of events, we move on to the uh, Philadelphia street fight uh, with special guest referee Bubba Ray Dudley, who I don't believe was announced until the day of. The day of, yeah. Uh, which would have affected our predictions of this match. Anyway, six-man tag team match, the pride of Bobby Lashley, Angelo Dawkins, and Montez Ford versus the final testament. I almost did it, you schmuck. <laughs> Uh, Karrion Cross, Akam, and Rezar. And the pride goes over. No, uh... Doesn't no, it always. No turns. Uh, nothing, nothing crazy here happened except three guys beating up three other guys. And we see the pride walk out victorious with a little bit of help from the special guest referee, Bubba Ray Dudley. Uh, no, it was it, it was an it was an acceptable match. It was a good. Uh, I'm going to use this term positively this time. A good deflator after the first match, mm-hmm. because it gave a little bit of like a okay, these guys are all talented, but this isn't really what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh, good for them. Hopefully, we can find something better to do with these guys and get them apart because I've given uh, literally zero. F's about this this feud. I do agree. Um, I think I mentioned it when Bobby Lashley came out, and I was like, I feel sorry for Bobby Lashley. And my friends who were right next to me were like, why do you feel bad for Bobby Lashley? I'm just like, the whole start, stop, start, stop career that he's kind of had ever since he came back, it seems like it's either been circumstantial or bad timing or, hey, we have this other guy here that we're going to pull the trigger on. So, Bobby, you can get to the back of the line or you can be on the back burner. Um, this was what it was. I loved uh, Bubba Ray uh, being in this match. Dudley Boys are my favorite tag team of all time. So seeing it was great. Um, I was almost I thought we were almost going to see a 3D through a table, which would have been a nice cap. And I almost feel like in a way this was a tribute for Paul just yeah. being inducted 24 hours before or uh, 48 hours before. I, I was kind of anticipating we might have seen uh, the prophets do the 3D. The 3D. Yeah. <laughs> so um, was it hardcore ECW? 
I think they sort of scratched a little bit of a surface, but it wasn't the typical ECW that uh, the hardcore fans know of. There was there was one botch that wasn't anybody in particular's fault where the pre-sawed table did break. <laughs> Just from putting the guy on the table. <laughs> I mean, thank goodness those tables are uh, loaded underneath the ring, because if it was just that one table, you're shit out of luck. Um, yeah, I thought this was fine. I thought it was okay. Uh, Montez almost diving into the crowd Yeah. that one point. <laughs> the dude's got frog legs. I don't know what to, what to tell you. He's crazy. And again, that was another instance of you didn't see it coming. Yeah. So I think when it comes to camera work, they're working on let's make this more spontaneous as opposed to I'm going to stand right here, shoot at this angle for 15 seconds so you can clearly know that there's something big coming. So they might hell, they might have just been changing their camera staff. Maybe they've got guys who have a better eye for this stuff than who they had before. I don't know. But yeah, this was fine for, again, we get to the middle of the card and much like night one, it's like, okay, let's keep the show rolling. What I, what I will say is that I think that uh, given the turn of events with Damian Priest, this might be an opportunity for this to be your next thing. You Like, I know we were talking about Andrade. Bobby is also a dude who may not necessarily be hurt too much taking a loss to Damian Priest to lift him. Bobby and the Pride could go against the Judgment Day. Yeah as Damien's first feud. We'll see if anything like that plays out on Raw when we go back and review it after this. <laughs> but there's an option. Yeah, you have a lot of viable candidates, and I think that's the thing, is that there's enough here where you have your next crop of champions, new champions, and you have your next crop of challengers for those new champions. Yeah. So it's a very unique time. It's interesting. I didn't even realize, like, we're sort of suggesting that half this roster, especially the ones who are veterans, take a little bit of a sabbatical. We talked about Becky. We talked about Seth. We talked about Drew. And I think that if they did, the product would not be harmed in in the least, not because they don't contribute to it, but you have the fresh new blood, the backup, right there, ready to go. It's the first time in a long time that it's felt like there were enough supporting players that could play the understudy yeah. that you feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Because with the elevation of people like Sam, uh, Sami Zayn and Ellie Knight and Kevin Owens and Randy's back, um, just speaking of the men's card, you've, uh, you've got enough guys. And even like Bobby and Andrade and uh, some of the Finn I think that Finn and JD may start to do their thing now, now that we've taken the belts off of Finn and Damien. Yeah. But there, there's plenty of people who can step into roles to give these guys time off, and this is sort of the carousel we've talked about that AEW has the potential to do, and WWE should take advantage of it just for their performers' health. Yeah. But that... That's where we're at. And speaking of two guys who could step into these supporting roles, that brings us to LA Knight versus AJ Styles. This is just your standard singles match. This is essentially your Jay Uso, Jimmy Uso match of the night. Of the night, too, yeah. And both these dudes, wildly talented. Both these dudes, not spring chickens, but they can still play a valid role, and LA Knight still has a lot to give. So the fact of the matter is I think we both sidled up to AJ Styles as the winner of this match in our predictions. This is honestly the better outcome for the guys in this yes. match is for LA Knight to have won. Yep. We just weren't anticipating that they would just go with it. I hope this feud is over now and that we've got, gotten over it. But who knows? They may try to prolong this one. I'd rather LA Knight move on to something else. But, again, acceptable match, two solid performers... They did, they did what they needed to do in a 12-minute match to propel us through the, through the card. Yeah, I thought this was a very... Uh, this was essentially Sammy versus Gunther when it comes to match quality. Um, I thought this match was great. Both men busting out, you know, basically like all the general moves in their moveset. Um, AJ Styles looking better than ever. You know, we were talking about The Rock, like someone who's not doing this weekly but hasn't lost a step. 
AJ Styles being someone who's not necessarily doing it every week, but is still there every week, grinding and traveling and going the distance, still is able to deliver on the biggest show of the year. Um, great match, and yes, I do agree. LA Knight winning, I feel like internally, was always sort of the better option because we were just talking about this. If you have a superstar who's on the up and up, I think that taking L's, especially to someone who's a veteran um, and is kind of like on his last run, probably not the best idea in the world, especially with LA Knight having all the cheers, all the pops, all the praise. So I thought this match was great. I loved every second of it. Yeah. I, I'm content with the way it ended and it left the crowd uh, and everybody saying L.A. Knight. Yeah. Which takes us into the other mid-card title match. Uh, Logan Paul uh, with I Show Speed. Uh, is that the same dude that was in the bottle the last time? I think so. Okay, well, now we need to stop that because it's annoying and, and repetitive. Don't be bottling up that anger now. And, Get it. and so anyway, Logan Paul goes into a triple threat match with Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. Uh, we were split on who would walk out with the title. We just knew. <laughs> yeah. We just knew it wasn't going to be Logan Paul, and boy, did we miss that one. I figured this was an opportunity to take the belt off Logan Paul, not really necessarily hurt him too much, and then he could do something else. Or he could also take some time off, and we could do something. <laughs> something else. Uh, the thing about Logan Paul, not that I personally view him as an attraction, but the company did. And I think that keeping the belt on him makes him less so. But then again, if he's able, he can sort of not, I guess, unfortunately, to make this comparison due to the fact that they had a feud. Uh, he's sort of a ricochet-style guy. He, he doesn't spring as much, but he's athletic. Yes. I'll give him that. He botched the hell out of the frog splash at the end of the match. I don't know what the hell happened. You'll, you'll have to go back and watch it. He jumps off the top rope. Don't know what he was doing with his arms or legs. I think he like did like a toe touch and then just landed. Yeah, he. I'm pretty sure he did it backwards, and it just like he, the, you know how you you normally do the the like yeah. hands down by your side and then come back yeah. up. He did something weird like a circular motion. Yeah, and then it, it almost seemed like he almost like hit his own foot, which would have thrown his like trajectory off. <laughs> and I was just like, God, that looked bad. Not like anybody was going to get hurt. It just, it was ugly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have what almost felt like sh- uh, would have been the way I anticipated the match going. We had the exchange of the finishers. And I was like, oh, Randy hit the uh, the RKO and uh, off of, on, on Kevin Owens. And then Logan Paul suddenly shows up, shoves him out and does his awkward fl- f- frog splash <laughs> to uh, pick up the win. So, yeah. Sure, whatever. <laughs> that's my very that's, well. That's my end. That it 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 it's three guys who are capable of putting on a good match, and I think I show speed put a put a uh, hammered the brakes for a minute. Don't think he needed to be there, especially because we've done the bit with the guy in the in the bottle before. <laughs> um, and I almost felt like Randy hit him with the RKO on the table with a little extra mustard, just he did. just for. <laughs> Just for fun. And he he literally, like, um, what's that kick called? Is it, like, a, a oh, shove the, kick? The, like, the Sparta kick that, that he did? The real hard kick? Yeah, yeah. but it's, like, it's like really, like, yeah. kicking him, like, yeah, away he from he kicked him. the hell out of him. <laughs> P- Pat McAfee, I think, was even off to the side. I think this is where it was. I show speed might be dead, <laughs> is what I think he yelled at one point. Um, it, uh, it was a match. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> I will say this. Uh, before even the match started, Kevin Owens rocking the ECW colors. I thought very neat, very immaculate. Um, also, I feel like Logan Paul coming out in his fancy prime like truck. And then Kevin Owens being like, yeah, well, I got an automobile of my own. And then he gets like a, like a, like a caddy, like a cart. Um, and then... <laughs> He drives it to the to like to right in front of the ring, and then Randy comes out, and Kevin just backs up. He's like, "Come on in, <laughs> come on in," and then Randy like gets into the back, and there's like a metal thing where like Randy can hold on to it. K- 
Kevin Nolan starts driving and you see Randy being like, hey, dude, like, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. Like, you – and you kind of had – this was kind of your comedic match. Yeah. Because uh, there was that moment where, um, you know, Kev, KO and Randy, yeah, we're on the same page. We're going to beat this guy up. And Randy goes for the RKO. Kevin Owens pushes him and looks at him like, what dude, and Randy's like, sorry, sorry my bad. <laughs> um, I thought this this match was fine. Um, they, I didn't even Randy, realize. Randy's just out here to have fun at this point. <laughs> Randy is having fun. I think that when you just look at him, he's just like he's having a great time. Yeah. Um, they kind of did like the triple double spot for each uh, competitor with um, Logan. It was the I don't know what he's calling it, so I'm just gonna call it what uh, Hangman calls it: the double buckshot lariat. Ko did the double cannonball, and then Orton did the double DDT. Yeah, kind of a little bit of an exchange from each wrestler. The match I thought was fine. Um, I was really hoping that Kevin would win, and uh, you know we would get like the WrestleMania twenty esque type of thing, um, which didn't happen. Um, and I kind of figured, I was like, you know, because if you really go back and think about it, Logan Paul kind of loses any time when the, when the lights are on bright. So I feel like they need to feel like, they felt like we need, we need to give Logan his moment. Yeah. Um, very athletic, really crazy how this guy like takes it almost like fish to water. Yeah. Which is really crazy. Um, I could see Logan Paul versus LA Knight. For a SummerSlam, where finally uh, yeah. LA Knight wins and you know becomes US champion, um, yeah. But I thought this match was fine. I uh, the pop up power bomb into the RKO, yeah, immaculate, great. Um, Randy does it like it's nobody's business. I don't. I can't recall like that. Like the RKO spot ever being botched. Not generally. It like, I feel like any time, well. whether it's like, where, whether it was the Evan Bourne one, the CM Punk one, the Seth Rollins one, now this one, there is, or the JD one from uh, War Games. Yeah. There's never been a botch. Like, knock on wood, but like, there's never been a botch for that. Randy seems to nail it each and every single time. Yeah. So. Which, I mean, to be fair, the structure of the move lends itself to it. Um, so it's, it's good that it's never happened. Um, and here's fingers crossed that it doesn't. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and piggybacking, I know I mentioned LA Knight real quickly and I said I would circle back to this for a brief moment, but the previous match, um, LA Knight versus AJ Styles, um, if you noticed this ended with just one finisher. Yeah. It wasn't a super finisher, uh, like a quadruple finisher. It was just one finisher Boom, match is over. Yeah. At first, it was kind of out of place because I think we're so used to seeing 80 finishers happen in one match. So when you do get the off occasion where, oh, one finisher, a one, two, three, okay. Kind of a breath of fresh air type of thing. So, but the triple threat I thought was fine. Yeah, the the whole prime bottle spot. We've done it we, before. We can retire it. Yeah, we can retire it. It's good. So... And speaking of championship matches, and we people then... people in their prime. And people in their prime. Get it? Uh, we move on to the WWE Women's Championship match, where EO Sky was defending the championship against the 2024 Women's Royal Rumble winner in Ding Dong Hello, Bailey. Uh, Bailey picks up the win. She walks out as the WWE Women's Champion, just like we both predicted, this was the right way to go. Yeah. Um, I've heard uh, I've heard some comp- or I've I've read some complaints about Io Sky not necessarily being ready for um, this level as a as a as a performer. I laugh at that, but I have my reasons. Continue. Not from like an athletic standpoint, but from like a spotlight standpoint. I still like Io. Um, I think that she. Maybe still has a little bit of room to grow, but that doesn't mean she's bad. Um, and I think that this was uh, Bailey's time. Yeah. And when we go back and we talk about good storytelling, this was another instance of where Bailey ultimately overcoming the odds and the betrayal of damage control to claim the belt. This is the way it should have been, the way it should have ended, and now we can see where 
it takes Bailey. I'm sure something exciting is going to happen this week to set up her next thing. But, yeah, that's all I'm going to say is congratulations to Bailey. Yeah, I thought that it was sort of a very interesting full circle moment. You have Bailey who introduced damage control. And for a long time, they were kind of on this high of like dominating the division, dominating the roster, kind of going through everybody. And then little by little, there is a dis- dissension among the ranks yeah. internally in the group. There's disagreements. There is, hey, this, hey, that. Um, I do agree. Bailey certainly deserves it. She's been, at this point, a veteran uh, for your uh, women's division. Uh, she is one of the four horsewomen. Um, I think that she's also another person who time after time doesn't mind adapting and like, you know, making subtle differences and like introducing new things. Um, in regards to what you were saying earlier about the comments about Io Sky, um, a, co- a mutual friend of ours has showed me um, Io Sky wrestling outside of the WWE. Yeah. And she is one of the most prolific performers I've ever seen. Uh, it's a topic for another time, but there is what we call or what I call the WWE formula where it's you bring in talent who are great but they get stifled they get watered down they are or told they, or they take too long to adjust yeah um but most times it's hey that move that you did on the indies you won't do that here hey your wrestling style we're going to have to change it you know we're going to have to adjust it um, cause I do think that if EO really wanted, she could have given you a five star banger if she really wanted to. And Bailey, we've seen before, there's the infamous stand in, no, the, um, takeover, the takeover match with Sasha Banks. Yeah. Um, if both women wanted, I think they could have stole the show, but for whether, where they're positioned and what the stakes are and where we are and the time that they obviously got, um, I thought this was fine match quality wise. It wasn't the best, but it got the job done. It did what it needed to do. Again, it's what you said a while ago that still stays with me to this day. WrestleMania is your new season. And we have to, you have to introduce the new somehow. And what better way to do it than to crown a new champion. And it doesn't hurt that these two were still given the third most amount of time in a match on this show, even more so than your combined World Heavyweight Championship matches. <laughs> so that shows the at least the confidence that they had in these two to uh, tell a compelling yeah. uh, story. Especially right before the biggest main event in WrestleMania history. Get it? Uh... So that brings us to the time, the final chapter, the final boss. The final countdown. The end, of an or end. is it, to <laughs> Cody Rhodes' story. You get the very dramatic entrances from both guys. This is Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns in a Bloodline Rules match for the undisputed WWE Championship. They've dropped the Universal every time I've heard them say it since he won. Beautiful. So, you have these dramatic entrances. Cody comes up wearing the weird 3D printed skull. But the, the moment after Brandy steps out from behind him, it's a, it's a warm moment. It feels, it feels important. It has the vibe of this is it. This is the time. And then he goes to the ring, and she disappears. But she, I, I, if I, I think uh, I, I was trying to read her mouth, and I think she said, uh, "Go finish your story." Yeah, I think is what she said. And he heads to the ring. Roman comes out. I, I forget exactly what his like fancy stuff was, but he comes out, and you get the. Announcement. It feels big. It feels like a main event. Samantha, by the way. Yeah, Samantha. Samantha Irvin. Er, er, Irvin. Irvin. Uh, hell of an announcer. And I will touch on uh, something that I'm sure you have heard or noticed since when the match ends. But continue. She she feels. Uh, Don't we all? And so the match begins. 
and it's going, and it's going. And this match goes for 33 minutes. So for these guys to be in a 44-minute match the night before, and then come out and do another 34-minute match on Sunday, good, good on these two. Especially, like, anybody who wanted to complain about Roman and how infrequently he shows up, like, do I, do I personally wish that we saw him a little bit more frequently than we did during this whole three-and-a-half-year championship run? Yeah. But this, is, this was probably a Herculean effort on his part to show up, to do both nights, to do two matches of the length that they were in a row. These guys went out there and they, they, they crushed it. Yeah. Uh... One comment I, I have is that I, not that the ma- match was poorly booked, but the bloodline rules aspect didn't seem to really matter for the first half of the match. Yeah. There was nothing looming. There was nothing looming over the these two for the first 10, 15 minutes of the match that made you go, ooh, Cody might lose. You're just like, okay, this is just a match. Cody's got a good shot if everything goes like this. I also think that uh, there was intense brutality displayed on Raw. Yeah. And it's almost like that was the climax of the br- brutality. Yeah. And then, because, like, there was one instance where Cody gets out a table, and I get it, okay, being the heel and trying to, like, screw with the fans, Roman slides the table back and goes, no, nah, we're not doing that. Yeah. But I almost feel like you kind of sort of advertised it as a bloodline match, and if your display on Raw was anything to go off of, you're selling it short now. Yeah. And, and that I, I agree. That's that's basically what my disappointment was in the first portion of the match. I was like, eh, they could have done more. Yeah. They could have done more with this. And then you get the first, finally, you get the first Bloodline um, presence, the first impact. And they definitely built toward the, the, the final boss purpose for the rock yeah but we're gonna build through that we got the first bloodline influence of the match jimmy comes out he attacks cody and you go ah this guy (laughs) and he and roman uh beat up cody a little bit and then jay does come out and he makes the save and he starts to take jimmy out and he runs him up the ramp, and we see Jimmy take his borrowed finishing maneuver, and he takes his brother right off the ramp. I think they almost missed the tables. It it looked close. Yeah. Uh, but that takes the Usos out of the out of the picture. Next, as we we see sort of a replay of WrestleMania thirty nine, where Cody hits one, he hits two, and as he stands up. Boom! Samoan spike from Solo Sokoa. You go, oh my god, not again. And as Solo is standing over Cody, you hear John Cena's theme start. And you go, oh man, John Cena's here? All right. And he comes running down to the ring, and he attacks Solo Sokoa and knocks him out of the ring. And then he turns and he picks up Roman, and he hits Roman with with. An AA. I responded to a guy that I saw comment online who said, I didn't like the fact that John Cena attacked Roman when he came out. I thought it was fine, and the reason is because the entire purpose of these guys running in and helping was that they were there to neutralize what the bloodline did. And that means net net neutral. Solo just hit him with a finishing move. He just hit Cody with the Samoan Spike. John then comes in. He hits Roman with an AA, which puts them back at base base neutral. Yeah. Perfectly fine with it. John gets out. He picks up Solo. He puts him through the announce table. And then we get that shot that we were kind of talking about where it's like, oh, something's coming. And then you see the bull come up. On the Titan Tron. Oh, we're getting a rehash of whichever recipe. Thrice in a lifetime. Yeah. And Cena gets in the ring. Rock gets in the ring. They do the very dramatic turn to the left, turn to the right, Rock reveal Hogan. your bu- revealed your bald spot. <laughs> uh, God bless John. Um, 
my 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 girlfriend commented uh, during that. John probably makes enough money <laughs> that he could that he could fix that. You're not the only one. Our wrestling clique has got a really big problem with John Cena's baldness. I don't like. I I don't have a problem with it. I feel a little bad that it was so prevalent. If his if it, the hair at the front of his head was grown longer, he could have actually covered it, or like she said, he could probably afford some hair plugs. Maybe he doesn't want them. I don't know. Or you could just. Or he could just shave his head. I mean, his, he could go back to looking like the prototype. Anyway, so we have these two face off, and John tries. He tries to wind up and hit the rock, and we end that real quick. Rock hits him with a rock bottom, neutralizes John Cena with some choice words. Yeah, get out. <laughs> and that brings us to the final. The final boss. Now you've got The Rock. He's in the ring. Time to fulfill the prophecy of beating the hell out of Cody Rhodes and stopping him from walking out with the title. Takes out the belt. Or takes, takes off the belt. Takes off the belt. And a strangely familiar theme hits in the form of the shield. And it's confusing for a second because you're like, how is this going to work? Given that one third of them doesn't work in the company. If the other one had been there, it would have been really, really unsettling. Crowd probably would have lost their minds. Even though he had no place being there. <laughs> Anywho, Rock's looking around. He's looking at the crowd like, where, where the hell are they? Who, who is this? What's going on? And then, without seeing anything happen, we see Roman running across frame. And he hits Seth Rollins, who has come out in full shield regalia with a chair, with a spear. Seth, who has already been in a 44-minute match, a 10-minute match, gotten kicked for real in the face, and lost his world title, is now out here again. And he's down, he's on the ground, Roman hits him with the spear, and I think he just sort of like... Collapses. Collapses. Yeah. And The Rock goes to return to what he was doing. And the, we, he, the lights go out and we hear a very familiar gong. And for me, I was expecting a different sound effect. But... So was I. At, like, this one makes a little bit of sense in the fact that at least Roman and The Undertaker have some sort of history. Lights come back up, Undertaker hits The Rock with a choke slam, and that neutralizes the final boss. So now you have two attitude arrows equalize each other. Yeah. That puts us back to the conclusion of our match, where you've got Cody in the ring, you've got Roman in the ring, you got a you got a beaten, bruised Seth Rollins in the corner, or you go. and a chair. And this is where you get... The beautiful storytelling. storytelling to finish this in that Roman picks up the chair and the words of I'm uniquely suited to be your shield resonate stronger than they have before as Roman looks at Cody like he's going to hit him. But then he turns to Seth who has his back to him. And you could almost have intercut, <laughs> if this were a movie, you could have almost intercut oh, they will. They the, will. the scene of him and Seth from when Seth first turned on the shield. Roman turns, he hits him, hits him with the chair, which buys Cody just enough time to rebound and pull off the triple crossroads for real this time and pick up the win in the most dramatic <laughs> cluster of a match we've ever seen at WrestleMania. Just hearing you describe it over the last five minutes, my God. And so Cody Rhodes finally finishes the story. You see all, his mother and Brandy and his father-in-law and all the guys from the back come down and they are celebrating and reveling in this and you can feel the emotion and Samantha Irvin could barely get the damn words out of her mouth and they, 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 they did release a video as well. I saw. 
Which of, I sent to you. Of her announcing this. And she is just, she's just choking. She had words. to like stand up at one point because, you know. And yeah, Samantha feels, she feels like we all wish we could sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like she, she has got to be an empath. I swear to God. Um, you had some thoughts. Did you want to chime back in on her? Um, I mean, just that is that there were a few notable things, uh, which I will kind of like inner inner sort of twine with that. Charles Robinson, the Rev, handing Cody the belt, and you see the smile on his face from ear to ear as he's like, "Dude, here you go, take it." You have Samantha, whose voice is cracking from all of the emotion. And the one thing that we all popped for, because I think this is kind of like we truly are in a new era, is when Michael Cole says, damn it, I love professional wrestling. (laughs) These things all in conjunction with one another, I think kind of sets the stage for you. Is that like every so often you get, I'm sure maybe you get this too from time to time where maybe an outsider goes, why do you love wrestling so much? What is it about wrestling that you love so much? And that moment, like the ending of the match, not even the match itself, just the ending of the match, is is a moment that you point and you go, that's why. Yeah. That's why I love this. And it's one of those things, and I know this is kind of like a like a thing on the internet, either you know or you don't know. Yeah. That's it. So, um... Yeah, I don't know if you want to finish your thoughts uh, before I sort of give my take on the whole match itself, but... This was a stellar way for them to end it, even with a little bit of the chaotic booking. I think they could have cleaned it up a little bit better. Is it weird if I call it a Attitude Era wet dream? (laughs) No, I think that 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 works. Uh, But, yeah, I think that this was a perfect way for them to conclude... All of these stories. You knew there was going to be mass chaos. Yeah. This wasn't going to be a straight up bloodline interference. Like, you had to go a little bit over the top. Yeah. Because I think that's exactly what Roman's title reign basically was. Was yeah. over the top. So, you know, if you're going to put an end to it, you know, you, you can't just have it be bloodline members and just what we've seen before you had to essentially go outside of the box and be like okay what do we do here um i think that you could have justifiably and this is just to to like crank up the bloodline factor i think you could have justifiably have had jimmy and solo at ringside from the beginning and you saw these little microaggressions yeah like nothing too crazy but like Cody coming off the ropes, Jay grabs his foot, <laughs> and build with some of that. And then you start interspersing everybody else. Jay comes over the barricade. He takes out Jimmy. Solo's off to the side. He's like, what the hell's going on? Well, whatever. Now he sees Cody about to take control. That's when he gets in and he hits the Samoan spike. And then everything else kind of plays out the way it did. But the emotional impact of this match, like you said, what makes you uh, love this stuff? WrestleMania 20. Mm. WrestleMania 30, mm. WrestleMania 40. Yeah. All the 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 last shots, mm. the emotion on these guy these people's faces is burned in your brain as a fan. And that's that's what we look for. That's why I'm optimistic about this next era of WWE is that with them now having the freedom to tell good stories instead of cater to a weird old man. <laughs> I think we might actually get things worthwhile. Yeah. We might see legitimate stories, legitimate characters. And I personally, as, as, as an actor, I watch professional wrestling. A, because I, I was indoctrinated earlier in my life. But I watch because I love stage combat. I watch because I like good acting, which not all of them are good at. Yeah. Admittedly. Yeah. Some, some professional wrestlers are terrible actors. But when you've got somebody who can make you feel something, yeah. that's when it resonates. And then these moments where you've got these little stories that even if the acting was shitty, <laughs> you've built the emotion, you care about these people uh, on a character level, that then when they finally reach the pinnacle of their goal, it feels fulfilling. Yeah. 
because they almost feel like a friend or a family member and you're like, can get it, Cody. And so the conclusion to WrestleMania 40, the biggest WrestleMania of all time. Debatable. Was, it was satisfactory. It was... Satisfying. It was cathartic. There it is again, bringing it full circle. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I agree with most of everything that you said. First 10, 15 minutes of the match didn't really seem like much. Um, I thought, it might, like you said, we could have done a little bit more, maybe a lot more. Um, once these interferences started happening, at one point, you're just trying to keep up with it because it's one after the other. But I think up until the last interference, everybody was neutralized. Uh, Like the sequence of everybody being neutralized was impeccable. Yeah. Because you talked about it. Jimmy comes out. Who's going to neutralize him? Jay. Because those two have been constantly down each other's throats and they just had a match, you know, 24 hours ago. Solo comes out. John Cena was a name that popped into my head because I immediately thought back to the 80 Samoan spikes that he ate and was soundly defeated. And I'm like, okay, who can sort of neutralize Solo? Boom, John Cena comes out. Um, And then you have, like you said, the final boss comes out, The Rock, and Seth comes out. And actually one thing that I'm pretty sure that you most likely did catch is the way that Seth landed after being hit with that chair. (laughs) <laughs> literally literally identical to how Roman landed yeah how he crumbled <laughs> yeah so um because like at first I was like what was the point of Seth coming out if that's all that was going to happen but he wound up being that last piece of the puzzle which set up the end of the match now before we get to that he for all intents and purposes neutralized Roman leaving Cody as the last man standing essentially from and the story it, stuff. From, story from the story perspective, yeah, it's like Roman, he made a choice there where it was vanquish your newest challenge and stop this guy from finishing the story. Or dwell on your past. Or, exactly. Um, and I think that they've always sort of somewhat told that story about Roman not being able to get over that, that night, that chair shot, that moment of Seth making that decision. But where you and I somewhat, I guess, disagree, but like also agree to agree and agree to disagree at the same time (laughs) is when The Undertaker came out. Yeah. Because the way that I kind of look at it and there is the bias, there is the selfishness, but also my argument is that everybody is being neutralized by a by a counterpart. Yeah. A viable counterpart. And you look at The Rock. Who do, it, you, who do you associate with him most? If I ask you, Dan, who's The Rock's greatest rival, what do you tell me? Stone Cold Steve Austin. So, you know, that's where I think, I think secretly everybody was waiting. Almost like where you hold your breath and you're like, that glass is going to shatter any second. Now it's, 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 it's going to happen. Um, and with The Rock kind of being a new authoritarian figure, there was an additional layer where it would have been sense where Stone Cold rolls up and he says, nah, I spent my entire career being against this shit. <laughs> um, so that's why when Undertaker came out, it's like, okay, all right. And again, one can make the argument of who else can Cody enlist the help of than, God bless Shawn Michaels, but... Mr. WrestleMania. Yeah. The guy who's had the most notorious WrestleMania streak of all time. You know, who else are you going to enlist to help you out? So, and then of course, Cody does this thing. You have the three crossroads. And again, Michael Cole, much like on night one where it was Cody is screwed. This time it was, um, what is it? Finished the story, I think is what he says on the three count. You know, family, friends, everybody comes in. What was so amazing for me is when you take just a brief moment and you look inside that ring and you see at the same time you have Cody Rhodes in the ring, you have Brandy Rhodes in the ring, 
you have CM Punk in the ring. And then not too far behind them when Cody goes, hey, Bruce Pritchard and Triple H, get out here. And you have Triple H in the middle of those three. And for a moment, it's almost like, in what lifetime does this happen in? Yeah. Because two years ago, if I told you this is what's going to happen, you would have never believed me. Yeah. But nonetheless, everybody comes out. It's a feel-good moment. I mean, I, like I said earlier, Samantha was feeling it. Michael Cole was feeling it. The referee was feeling it. Um, and I think there was a solid moment there where there was no commentary. It was just... Living it. Taking in the moment. Yeah. For a moment, I was like, are they off the air? Like, is it done? Is this just, like, extra, like, off the air footage that we're getting? And no. It was just let, like, it's like, like just take it in. Live it. Enjoy it. Um, the pop was loud for Cody. But I think what got a sort of nice pop was uh, Cody handing the title to his mom. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say though is I hope that now we can leave the story yeah. behind we can leave Dusty behind we can leave for my father behind it's time for Cody to write his own his own book yes his own chapter in yeah. his own book Um, so that that's just that's like my my gripe with it is that Starting today, essentially, we move on from that. Yeah, you can allude. I I, to... Sorry, I don't know. I don't know if you wa- if you saw. I did. His, his opening segment tonight. Yeah, Triple H says, "And the man who's going to lead us into this new era," and he introduces Cody. Yeah. So there you there you go. The ex- you can't have a better endorsement than that. <laughs> yeah, the exchange with The Rock was a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, I was almost thinking that, uh, cause the rumor on the street is that Cody's going to bring back an old school belt or a rendition of an old school belt. Yeah. And I thought it would have been brilliant if when Cody gives the belt to rock, he's like, yeah, you can hold it. And then slowly he's like, well, rock, here's your people's championship back. And while you're at it, you can keep that title too. I don't want it. Yeah. Goes from under the ring. Cause this is my belt now. I thought that would have been great, but it was a little bit awkward. And I can already see uh, an issue that I'm having with Cody yeah. is you're a nice guy, but don't fall victim to being too nice. Yeah. Because I think that's going to turn everybody off, if not now, eventually. Yeah. Too much, too much honor. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you can be a nice guy. You can be the face of the company. You can be the biggest face of all time, but... We know you're a good guy, but you have to know when to turn it on. Yeah, exactly. Or turn it off. Um, I meant the intensity. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, all in all, was this a little bit overbooked? Sure. But I think that considering what we were, like, what this title match was and what the implications were, uh, you couldn't have a straight up typical Roman Reigns match booking to finish the story. Yeah. You needed to go outside of the box. You needed to kind of, in a very beautiful way, you had the Attitude Era. You had the Ruthless Aggression, sort of the PG Era and John Cena. And then... Solo almost as the stand-in for Umaga. Yeah, in many ways, yes. Um, You had Seth and Cody as your, like, last 10 years... uh, what did Triple H call it like 10 years back? I forget the, the revolution era or he said something. He probably said it once. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you kind of have all these different eras. All that's missing was literally Hulk Hogan and you, you got it all covered. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you have like all these eras kind of clashing in those last five, 10 minutes. Then now forever. Then now forever. And then as we saw after the match together, <laughs> um, all in all, I thought this was great. It was outlandish. It was over the top. It was it was me and you sitting down on a Saturday evening fantasy booking about <laughs> about something that we probably thought we knew for a fact that would never happen, but essentially it did. Yeah. 
Because this is the stuff that you see in the video games. You don't, you don't, you don't get this type of match or this type of conclusion every so often. Yeah. So. What what yeah. I will what I will say, not about the match specifically, but where we can go from next, is I think that the next stage of Roman's story. To me. I think has to bring him and Seth back together now. Interesting. I think that that is. I think that that is the most poetic thing that they could do now, from a storytelling perspective. Is that he lost everything because he couldn't let go of the past, and now he has to basically redesign, rebuild, and reclaim Get it? after everything that happened with Seth. And so, for him to lose everything, now I think it makes sense for them to eventually, not immediately, but eventually reconvene somewhere near the top. And I think that having that feel-good moment... Like, tell me you wouldn't feel something if we build to a moment where Seth and Roman hug in the fucking ring. (sighs) Burying everything from the past. Burying the fact that Seth is the reason he lost his three-year title reign. Didn't we kind of do that before? Yeah, but it didn't have as many stakes on it. It didn't have the depth of writing as it did. Because I, I don't... Because I think it was... Uh, I don't think it happened while Roman was a heel, did it? No. Uh, Roman had just... Uh, was that when they first remanded? When Roman came back from the leukemia? Ambrose was kind of dwindling. He was on his way out. And That's then, when Ambrose turned, right? Yeah. And they haven't had any other, like, re um, reuniting moments, have they? No, they've mostly just been, like, Polar sort opposite. of at odds. Yeah. And not feuding with each other, but, like, being the antithesis of each other. Yeah. And I think that that could be the ultimate endgame now, if we're still putting together cinema... Is to have now Roman, I, th- I think Roman has to now transition from being a heel to being sort of a tweener. Because people love him now. They appreciate Roman Reigns. They acknowledge their tribal chief. Please don't. <laughs> but I don't think he should. I think he needs to now accept that on some level. And I think that if he can't come, if he takes some time off and he comes back and he's now a good version, not good, but like a face version of the tribal chief, I think that that will not, and and again, not immediately. I think there needs to be a trajectory. Yeah. But I think that that might be the most interesting way to take him. I think that, and this is maybe just like sort of trying to like think old school about it, is that I almost feel like Moxley missing will always feel like there's something missing here. Yeah. You have the story of Seth and Roman, that's fine, but it's like the shield was a group of three. And it's almost like, yeah, you got two out of the three, but, you know, Moxley's on the side doing his own thing. I would almost say that with Triple H at the helm, you could resign him eventually, and I would I would have that hug happen, and then I'd have his music hit, and people would lose it. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't bring him back. And a then two for him. one in the matter of a few seconds. Okay, all right, <laughs> I'll bite. But um, I could even see Roman versus Seth for a potential WrestleMania match. Yeah, because uh, I think the underlying story of that is that. Roman has never beat Seth. Yeah. So, and I think Roman was... Seth was the only guy that Roman didn't beat. Yeah. When he was champion for three years. Yeah. So... The, and, that, and that could work. It could be a... There's layers to it. It could be a... That leads to that match. They're still at odds. And then after it, they they return the respect. And now they're, now they're kosher. And then John Moxley comes back. And then John Moxley comes back. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no telling, you know, we've done this before where after a big WrestleMania, we'll say, we think it's going to be this, we think it's going to be that. And then it just, it's a complete 180 from what we thought it was yeah. going to be. But I will say to be fair, what I feel like is so different now compared to the past, we're literally at the beginning of a new era. Yeah. 
it's triple like you I feel like it's a thing now. It's the Paul Levesque era. It's Triple H in charge. It's all these changes that we're seeing. And I think that in the press conference, uh Triple H said, We're not focused on the newest like laser beam lights. We're not focused on the newest graphics that we can display on like when a wrestler is coming out. To us it's about let's put on the best product that we can. And I think and I'm sure you would agree to this, for years, that's exactly what's been missing. Yeah. Is oftentimes, if you asked us and said, what would you like to see? We would tell you great storytelling, you know, because more often than not, a story was right in front of them, and they thought, well, let's veer off and do this instead. It was like ordering your storyline on Wish. Yeah. You'd look at the picture and be like, that looks really cool, and then you order it, and when it shows up, it falls Um, apart in four minutes. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I will say that I think that the words they used to peddle that JR used to be famous for spouting have never been truer than they are now and that is that anything can happen in the WWE yeah. because we've seen it over the last six months alone a lot has happened that you, un, that under the previous regime, you never could have fathomed, because it was run by a person who was petty and vindictive and morally corrupt, and not to say I mean I don't know these people, but now uh, not to say that they're not morally corrupt, but it seems like they're more interested in putting something together of quality, of merit, of value. And if that involves bringing back somebody like a CM Punk or bringing in somebody like a Kenny Omega at some point, it's viable. I will one-up you and say that the expression of never say never, Yeah, I think now is more profound than it's ever been. Yeah. You, uh, I, it's funny. I heard somewhere someone said that this whole thing like what we're talking about right now, this new era, this new way of, of going about it, in more ways, if you can think about it, essentially kind of all started with Cody's return to the WWE. Yeah. I think like that was kind of um, the spark that then lit up the fire because you saw after that how, okay, Cody would come out, he would say the terms professional wrestling, he would say belt. He would name drop people who were you weren't supposed to name drop. He would do things that you're not supposed to do. Yeah, it was melting the ice that was on the WWE Universe for so long. And then with Vince getting out of there, kind of coming back, and then really getting out of there permanently, then you have the... <laughs> then you have the whole CM Punk part of it. You have just like things that you thought would not happen. I think Cody was the was the wake up call, and I think Vince was the only one who couldn't, who still really didn't want to see it. He was the wake up call that doing things that the fans wanted made sense, made them care, made them want it, made them buy tickets, and Triple H and the other people backstage who were still there were like. Well, if this guy ever gets the hell out of here, we can really dive in. And as soon as he did, that's where CM Punk came back. CM Punk had been ousted from the other company, and Triple H was like, well, shit, we'll take him. I'll, I'll bury the hatchet. I, like, Triple H has grown as a person from, what, from everything we can tell, from yeah. his actions. He may have, he, he may have previously been kind of like Shawn Michaels was back in the day, a little bit of an egotist, a little bit of a... Golden shovel. Yeah. But he's grown because now he's a business. Now he's a businessman. Yeah. And he goes, I I lived this business. I know what the fans wanted, even if it didn't always work for me. We should give it to them. Because that's how you're gonna maintain longevity. That's how you're going to maintain a fan base. Because when it went, not to say like this is an oversimplification. When when they went PG, a lot of Attitude Era fans were like. <sighs> All right. And not to say we need to go all the way back to the Attitude Era, because there's some questionable shit. Yeah. There's definitely some problematic stuff back then, and that was because 
probably in big part due to the fact that BKM was running around unfucking leashed. There was nothing keeping him in check. He would do whatever the hell he wanted. He would make Trish Stratus bark like a dog and walk around on her knees, which you could not do today. Oh. And you shouldn't do today. She, especially with, like, with hindsight being what it is. Trish brought so much more value to that company as a champion, as a wrestler. She may not have been ready. She may have been a little bit like a... Um, like a... Not Lana. That's like a Liv Morgan. Liv Morgan was fine, but she wasn't great. I still don't know if I'd put her at great. I still love her, but she's gotten much better. Yeah. And Trish improved astronomically, and her and Lita wrote a whole new chapter of women's wrestling because they were given chances. They were given time. They got to build stories, and again, some of the stories, problematic. Yeah. But... In this day and age, where there is more credibility, where the the company seems to keep itself in check more often than not, yeah, they can explore it from a creative standpoint because creativity is going to be the catalyst for building these long-standing, uh, engaging relationships with the fan base, and it's the reason we're still talking about WrestleMania forty as enthusiastically as we are right now. Well. You, uh, I was, I mean, I'll, I'll draw the comparison. <laughs> you, uh, remember last year? Yeah. Where we were, I, I remember like it was yesterday, for a complete 24 hours, and I can't tell you the last time that's happened, it hasn't happened since, where because of wrestling, not even, like, not because of life, not because of work, not because of stress, because of wrestling, I was deflated for 24 hours. Yeah. Because I couldn't stand with the decision that was made. And I was almost sure that the opposite of what happened was going to happen. Yeah. And you heard that Vince, while he was out of there, had his influence yeah. still. Which I think ultimately was the decision of Roman walks out as champion. And, and of course, you don't always like... Obviously, you got to have a, a, like instances where the bad guy wins and the good guy, you know, he's not able to do it. But I also think if you look at WrestleMania for the most part, you will always see it as the event where there's always that one guy that's coming up and we need to pull the trigger on him. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many instances we can... And obviously some of these didn't pan out the way that they were hoping, but you have... You do have Ultimate Warrior. You have Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 12. You have Steve Austin at WrestleMania 14. You have um, Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 19. You have Stevie at WrestleMania 20. You have Batista and Johnson at WrestleMania 21. Rey Mysterio at 22. You have... Um, I can't even think. Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 30. Shinsuke. You have Shinsuke. You have um, Cody at WrestleMania 40. You have all these things, all these instances, all these moments, these nuggets in time where you say, you know, there's this one person that's really climbing up. I mean, not there's not much of an emphasis because of obvious reasons, but Drew McIntyre, yeah. WrestleMania 36. Becky Lynch, WrestleMania 35. You have these instances where there's that one person, or in today's day, there's one female and one male talent, and they're rising up the ranks. <clears throat> and we have to pull the trigger on them because the iron's hot. Yeah. If we wait, this is going to die down and it's not going to work. Yeah. And I truly feel like this year, not just because the good guy won, but... That's exactly what they did, which is why it kind of has that old school attitude era, ruthless aggression era esque sort of ingredient to it. It also ha it has an undertone of of justice. Yeah. Because after last year, we didn't know what they were gonna do. We didn't. And we didn't trust that they were gonna do right by what they did. Very quick side note, you're not gonna sit here and tell me that this was the plan all along. Yeah. You're not gonna sit here and tell me that because obviously in the midst of them crafting whatever they were crafting, you have CM Punk getting injured. Yeah. Which I think sort of threw everything off. 
But this was definitely one of the better pivots yeah. than what they usually do. Now let me just float a conspiracy theory. CM Punk tore his own tricep to fix WWE. <laughs> Get it? Well, it's funny because I, I think I told you last time that it was CM Punk wasn't the reason, but CM Punk essentially was a big reason as to why the whole Daniel Bryan Yeslemania thing happened. Yeah. Um, and it's ironic that in the midst of them doing what they were doing, Punk once again was that wrench yeah. that was thrown into everybody's plans. Now, hopefully, next year at this time, we'll be saying that CM Punk finally got his moment. This now, ta- this also now takes a little bit of pressure off of him, uh, off of him, because he doesn't have to share the spotlight, or maybe it may- adds pressure. He doesn't have to share the spotlight with Cody. Cody got to take care of his business this year. Now, next year can be about Punk. Yeah. So. You know, obviously, that's fantasy booking, but I think, like, kind of looking at the era now, it's promising. Yeah. Like, you feel hopeful. You feel like, okay, now now, now we're doing something. We're going somewhere now. And, obviously, it's not going to be perfect, as this WrestleMania card was a clear indication of that. It yeah. wasn't perfect, and I will not call it the greatest WrestleMania of all time. <laughs> now... Was the main event one of the greatest main events of all time? Yeah, it was. Because it was fun. Yeah. And there was something that wasn't present in previous WrestleManias for the most part. Genuine emotion. Yeah. We talked about Samantha breaking. We talked about Michael Cole. Uh, and like that's where the creative freedom, right, kind of comes in. Is if Vince was around... You wouldn't hear Michael Cole saying that because the second that he said that, Vince would have tore his ear off yeah. on that headset. You have the referee with this bright smile on his face going, here, kid, take it. Like, you know, revel in your moment. Um, I'm very happy with it. I really, really am. I Because if they didn't do it this year, I truly believe that Cody's story would be finished. Yeah, and it not been, like throwing the book in a fire. Yeah, and I at that point I I would think you can't continue being a wrestler in the WWE. Yeah, if you lose a tag team match and you lose the main event again. Yeah. Well, and it sets it would have set a terrible precedent because you got performers who came to WWE with the hope, the hope, not that they were banking on it necessarily, but the hope. Of being able to live one of these dreams, even if it's not, even if it's not for the world title, like getting a WrestleMania moment over the IC title, Sammy, like that's a big moment for a person. Yeah. If I got to be a professional wrestler and I won the IC championship in front of how, how many people? 70,000 70, people at WrestleMania. Oh my God! You bet your ass that's one of the marquee moments of my damn life. And I think. That's also an, another beautiful thing is that all these superstars who for a long time were kind of given the back burner treatment. Yeah. Running down a short list, your Sami Zayn's, your Kevin Owens, in a different lifetime potentially your LA Knights. Yeah. You know, all these people would have gotten Drew McIntyre would have gotten the short end of the stick. Yeah. Just because like you said, Vince was always more focused on the main event. And once the main event is intact, everything else is just secondary. And his own his own fun. Yeah. Like, he, he would have 100% booked The Rock versus Roman this year, hoping that he'd get to hold out till next year or, or settle for SummerSlam to, to maybe through... I, I can only imagine his, impre- his his thought process would have been, all right, we'll throw him a bone. That was a little more Triple H than Vince, but uh, we'll throw the fans a bone. Co- now Cody can win, now that we've beaten Hogan's record. We talked about that being a, a question mark, and I said, I don't think that matters anymore. Well, you remember, what was my initial reasoning for not believing that Cody was going to finish the story? That. Because... 
look, I get it. Like last year, it was the same story. It was Roman needs to hit a thousand days. Yeah. Okay. He hit the thousand days. And then it was just done. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah. And so... I don't think any WWE fan gave a rat's ass that he hit a thousand days. um, Unless if you were like the pro-Roman Reigns tribal chief fans. Like nobody was throwing a damn thousand day party for Roman Reigns at their house. Yeah. Maybe a couple weirdos. But like... (laughs) Okay, cool. Great. Good for him. Moving on. Like you said, once we got to day 1001, didn't matter. Also, I think, you know, it's rolling with the times. Yeah. It's, we're not in the San Martino era anymore. It's not the Bob Backlund era anymore. Yeah. It's, granted, you also don't want to be handing off championships to each and every person on the roster just because there's a new flavor of the month in town. Because it devalues the title. It's, it's a line to walk. Yeah. But it's, I don't think it, I think it's a wider line than WWE used to give credit. And under the Triple H regime so far, you, like, look at all, like, Rhea is still your champion, and she's been so for 300 some odd days. Gunther, who just lost, was your champion for 600 600. some odd days. Um, There hasn't been, like, a short, short title run. Yeah. Um, Well, and that's the thing, right? But... I saw a graphic earlier that talked about champ like the the reigns that ended at WrestleMania. It was like six. It was like six different title changes happened yes uh, this weekend. Yeah, tag Great. team intercontinental. Now somebody else gets the chance to build a legacy, and it's fine. You can do that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, uh, it's again we we talk about this the way that we do. I mean, we've we've veered off of WrestleMania at this point because I think it's just you could almost cut this section off and make it its own video if you wanted to. <laughs> but I think it's the genuine, part of the pun, raw emotion. Yeah, it's what we've been asking for for you, especially since the beginning of this podcast. You think about how many times we did a state of the WWE address where we were like, if they just pull the trigger on this story, yeah. How great would it be? Yeah. And it almost seems like it would either get Becky lynched, where we wanted Ronda versus Becky. Okay, we'll give you that, but we're going to throw Charlotte in there. Yeah. It was always, there was always an agenda. Yeah. It wasn't just, here's what you want, here, take it. Yeah. And I think that's why WrestleMania 40 is, if nothing cathartic, solid. I would even say satisfying is because they gave you what you wanted. Yeah. So to conclude, do you have any final thoughts about WrestleMania 40, the direction we're going in and just where we go from here? The final thought that I have is that my optimism for the future of WWE is probably at an all-time high. Wow, okay. And, well, or at least in a very, very long time. And I'm hoping that we continue to see this the growth and the development of this new team who's in charge of everything to not take for granted the success they just had yeah and they don't need to do anything crazy to try and outdo themselves all they need to do is try Mm -hmm. which it felt like wasn't even on the wasn't even in the cards for a long time yeah so if they make a point of trying to put together compelling stories because they're a television show full of interesting and variant characters and listen to the fans and the vibe and the pulse, they'll be fine. Yeah. And I'm optimistic that Paul Levesque is going to do that a thousand times better than VKM ever did. Yeah. 
agreed, concur, um, whatever they're doing, continue doing it and don't stop. You know, I know that it, there's factors, there's TKO, there's the merger, there, there's all that. But I think at the end of the day, if you ask anybody who's in a suit and tie, what is the goal here? They're going to tell you the goal is to make money. And if Cody is any consolation, you see the merchandise sales increase. You see the intrigue. You see the movement that happens when you take away the main event and you say, we're going to insert someone who's not here weekly. And you see the backlash and you see the support and you see people get behind a beautiful story that has a big climax and an even bigger resolution. If this is any, if this is anything to go by, if this is what's in store for us, as AAA said tonight, Cody introducing this new era, pardon the pun, I think we're all in. That's it. From a business perspective, Sunday was Avengers Endgame. It was the it was everything that the entire WWECU has been building toward. And using Marvel as an example, everything since Endgame hasn't quite lived up to what came before. Mm-hmm. And now that we've finished it, we need to reboot the saga. Yeah. And this is an opportunity for a fresh start to build a new version of the WWE CU. And this is what they need to not forget and take advantage of, is what got them to the success the other day and use that as a learning tool instead of throwing it out the window. Using it as a stepping stone. Yeah. Yeah. Because good business is what's going to give them those results. Yeah, I agree. And I think, again, we're very much... I think they're aware of that. I think that now us fans, we're we're aware of it. Especially, like I talked about earlier, Triple H saying we're implementing these changes, we're trying things out. I keep on hearing that there is more creative freedom now from commentators, talent, everybody, that it's not as... Hands wrapped around your throat. Now it's you know, a collaborative art form. Which which is what it should have been the whole time. Yeah. And I think that's why things like the Attitude Era worked was because we were talking about Samantha earlier. Samantha is a... She's a recognizable figure at ringside. She's not just the, the newest ring announcer. She sort of has her own persona. She has her own gimmick. You recognize her, kind of like back in the day where it was Howard Finkel and your commentary team was J.R. and King and your referee was Earl Hebner and all these people that had, for lack of a better word, minute roles, you knew who they were. They served a purpose in the overall picture. They were expendable. I feel like we're kind of getting back to that, where everything is getting a flavor again. And so if they just continue with this, it's like you said, I think this will be a reboot. I think this will be a new era. And I think at the end of the day, even if they if they call it that, I wouldn't have a problem with it. The new era. Yeah. Because that's exactly what it's bringing along with it is something new. So there you go, guys, to wrap up a... Uh, a very unique episode. I th- I think I think I don't know about you, but I I think like in the flesh, I genuinely enjoyed this one because we just I feel like we really got out like what was in here. It it, t- it turned into a little bit of a therapy session. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. No. Um, but let us Th- know. Therapy is healthy and it's good, and more people should probably do it. Amen. Um, so there you go, guys. We just reviewed WrestleMania 40 and kind of where we think this new era is going to expand and take off to. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. What did you guys think of WrestleMania 40, night one and night two? 
another one that's done in the books. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you all next.